when you go back as far as history goes, we know that moms and dads took care of their kids. Neither one of them had a particular responsibility or a priority. It was just done mutually, or not being the sole provider. Then the community itself took care of families. And somewhere along in the last 60 years or so, we've kind of changed that. And now it's becoming a norm where parents are no longer the sole proprietors over kids. And we've moved away from that accepted aspect of having shared parenting. I also find it amazing if you look back at things, at how fast times change. Think about it, only 40 years ago or less, the invention of the color TV took over a year to sell a million models. And yet today, iPhone can launch a new model of a phone and within two minutes sells a million versions. With these changes, we all need to adapt. So the big question here is, where do you think we will be in five years from now on topics like family mental health and well-being if we don't start making changes today? I'll be honest, it scares me. I personally believe that kids deserve healthy parents in a, in a family, and of course within the parameters that parents are capable of doing so. That said, all moms, dads, and families should have the same equality to having healthy families. So, who am I? Well, I'm Tom Beckedorf. I'm the Director of Community Development for Canadian Association for Equality, Calgary. And you'll have, hear me refer to as CAFE. So, to get the program going, you will hear a little bit later from me about a few other things and how we all fit into this program for today. So, anyhow, let's get things started with the program. And first, let me introduce you to Don Zest. He's our Associate Branch Director and Community Outreach Officer at CAFE and our MC for today's program. So please, welcome Don to the podium. How's everybody today? Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, like Tom said, I'm the Associate Branch Director for the Canadian Association for Equality in Calgary. Um, now, part of the reason why we're here today is um, we really want to open a Canadian Center for Men and Families in Calgary. Um, now what that is, is it's a um, program-based uh, focus uh, with, with male having services for men. Uh, we, we all know that men are very reluctant to, uh, to take on uh, mental health and we, we think it's a very important part of, of what we need here in Calgary as well as uh, what we've seen in other places. <coughs> Um, now, as far as keeping your family together, uh, kids need two parents and uh, shared parenting and we want to avoid uh, parental alienation and estrangement. So today uh, we have in our um, company uh, Dr. Christine Giancarlo from Mount Royal University. Now uh, Christine was at our uh, last event and I'm very grateful that she's here for our event today. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects today, uh, family law and court, uh, family law, psychology. Um, you know, we want to talk about how your kids are affected when your family breaks up, uh, talk about parenting, best practices when the family breaks up. Uh, we will have a panel discussion and we'll be able to answer any questions for anybody later on. And. Um, you know, the big thing is avoiding these fractured families uh, with common issues, concerns, overcoming the stigma of mental health, and implementing solutions. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, Christine and hear from her. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Christine John Carlo and I teach at Mount Royal University. I'm an anthropologist. I study humans over time and over space. And I look for the reasons why we behave the way we do. I'm also a reluctant expert. 
I was married to someone who was systematically alienated from his children over a 10 year period. And I watched and participated during that time as we tried to get help for his three daughters to no avail. I also have two children from my first marriage. Both are doing very well because we were able to maintain equal parenting throughout uh, and in every way possible we're a united front for our kids. Today I hope to provide you with some information and hopefully some tools to use in your own experiences with parenting and grandparenting in the very tough context which is parental alienation. Children become well-adjusted, resilient, intelligent, critical thinkers when they have maximum support from both parents, both positive, loving, and capable parents. Such parents may either live in one household and have an intact relationship, or they don't. Ideally, their children also have an involved extended family, especially grandparents. Siblings also teach survival skills in the very highly social context of competition. Uh, exceptions to the ideal happen, but the more family support for a child, the better that child's mental and physical health will be. Quality of parenting and school performance are the key indicators of life success. What happens before adulthood determines adulthood to a significant degree. Parental alienation is a campaign by one parent to destroy the children's relationship with the other parent. <coughs> it's most commonly seen following separation and divorce, but it is sometimes seen in intact households as well. The child becomes enmeshed with one parent, uh, which really means inappropriately attached. Uh, this you would see, for example, when a parent is perceived as a friend of the child, and vice versa, rather than keeping the uh, authority that is necessary to be a good parent. Um, the alienator actively enmeshes the child with him or her. And, and the child develops a false belief that the other parent, the targeted parent, is evil. Parental alienation is a mental health, not a parental rights issue. So who are these alienators? These are parents who engage in denigrating their ex, bad-mouthing their ex, uh, and making the ex almost a, uh, you know, almost just a burden in the eyes of the child. And they, and they will uh, engage in this kind of behavior either through ignorance where they do not even know they're doing it so this would be, for example, things like eye rolling, you know, when the child mentions the other parent, I had a really fun time with dad this weekend. Oh, really? You know, that's that sort of thing. Um, or sometimes it's intentional when the ex, for example, wants to destroy their ex and they use the child as the vehicle in which to do that. Likely, the majority of alienators suffer from either borderline personality disorder or narcissism. And the literature, literature is becoming more and more solid all the time to this effect. So the, the mental health and mental illness aspects of parental alienation are really, really critical. And what you're seeing there, by the way, um, there is a pie chart, men, uh, alienators with mental illness, according to our study, so Rotman's and mine, which was published in 2015. And we studied 28 families that were dealing with parental alienation. I interviewed each, par each alienated parent. Um, the interviews were anywhere between two and four hours each, and they were done in BC and Alberta. And in those interviews, I asked very loose questions because the idea was to get the parent to tell me as much as he or she was comfortable with. And what, what I was kind of surprised to find, as was Kara, um, was that <coughs> diagnosed mental illness was apparent in the alienator in, look at the orange triangle there, 
Um, so we found, I think it was six out of 28 cases where in fact it was a known fact that the alienator in fact did have ongoing mental health issues. Um, it was suspected in the blue triangle that you're looking at and that was because uh, the alienator's family, um, including his or her own parents, so family of origin, had some concerns about the mental health of the alienating parent. And in the, in the green uh, expanse there, it was not discussed at all. It just did not come up in conversation and I did not ask. There are myths about parental alienation that persist and these are incredibly dangerous and are having a big impact on how this issue is perceived by the general public. The first one is that there is insufficient evidence to prove parental alienation. Well, this past spring, I was at two very important conferences. One was the International Shared Parenting, and the other was the Parental Alienation Study Group conferences. And each of those had over 100 world-renowned experts in the, area, in the areas of, uh, of academia, um, and from over 30 countries. And these people included psychiatrists, psychologists, physicians, social scientists like myself, and mediators. From our most current and compiled research, here are the myths that, and the realities about what's actually going on with this issue. So there, is, there are all kinds of studies, hundreds of peer-reviewed studies, both empirical and ethnographic. Uh, and they are using methodology which is quantitative, so lots of statistics, and also qualitative, where these are first-hand interviews uh, done like the study that, that um, we carried out. The second myth is that the alienated parent has caused the alienation. It's therefore in estrangement instead. Well, estrangement is where a child actually has a warranted reason for severing ties with a parent. For example, <coughs> that child has been uh, physically, sexually, mentally abused. And so we're not talking about estrangement. The reality of parental alienation is that the alienated parents are by definition loving, positive, capable people, and they had close bonds with their children prior to the separation or divorce, and prior to the alienation campaign. Third, the child knows what's in its best interest. Any parent knows this is not the case. That's why they're called children. They are not fully developed adults at that point. So in fact, parents would need to set no boundaries if children knew what was in their best interest. Children thrive with consistent positive boundaries and positive discipline. Alienated children suffer from Stockholm Syndrome where they are inappropriately attached to one parent or the kidnapper. In this case, the alienator acts very much the same as a kidnapper and the dependency on that parent is maximized. Uh, children who have been alienated will report complete alignment and love for only the alienator. Absolutely none for the targeted parent. Uh, there was a very interesting set of statistics that I saw at that conference. Uh, I wanted to bring the graph today and I haven't been able to, to um, obtain it yet. And what it showed was that children who came from abused households where one parent was known to be abusive, uh, and, the, and children who came from uh, families of alienation where one parent was targeted raided their parents. And in fact, the children who were from abusive households rated the abuser higher, much higher, than children rated the targeted parent in families dealing with alienation. So the alienated parent is deemed to be truly evil. There is no in-between. They're not an okay parent. Abusive kid or kids that have suffered abuse uh, outside of alienation want to please the abuser. Uh, the alienator just has an alternate parenting style. 
Well, the fact is alienators most often, or perhaps even always, suffer from personality disorders, further motivated by financial rewards and revenge. They are focused on their own warped needs from underlying attachment and probably abandonment issues as well. This is not parenting in any way. And now the myths about the treatment. Uh, sorry, I missed a, a couple. Um, parental alienation cases are high conflict. They're actually not high conflict cases because only one parent, the alienator, seeks conflict. In fact, the alienator thrives on conflict. The other parent wants what's best for his or her child and will try to placate the alienator as much as possible. The child will be better off if the targeted parent leaves his or her children. And lawyers often will promote this idea. You know, why don't you just walk away, leave your kids, they can't deal with the conflict you're making their life more difficult. However, fact, the targeted parent is the capable parent desperately needed as the stable influence in his or her child's life. The alienator is unstable and incapable of putting the child's needs and interests first. Children who lose a healthy, capable parent really lose half of themselves. Um, from the FBI archives and the US Census Bureau, father deprivation is a more reliable predictor of both criminal and addictive activity in adulthood than ethnicity, environment, or poverty. And so now the myths about the treatment of parental alienation. Some of these are known, I think some of these are somewhat controversial, but the evidence is sound that in fact there are five myths that are preventing or at least stalling the resolution of parental alienation, which is largely the, the uh, social issue of our time where children are concerned. First, parental alienation is gendered. No, it's not. Um, any gender and both sexes can be alienators. Alienators are more often mothers because courts most often grant sole custody to mothers. If courts granted custody most often to fathers, and if mothers on average were the primary family breadwinners, most alienators would be fathers. Biases by judges and lawyers assume women are instinctive nurturers and fathers are providers. This archaic belief stems back 10,000 years to the history of patriarchy in which men owned their women and children. Fortunately, feminism is helping to deconstruct discrimination against women. I'm very grateful for that. I think we should all be very grateful for that. We are moving towards equality, hopefully. As feminism moves forward and as disc gender discrimination decreases, women become equally important providers for the family and men must become equally important nurturers and parents when mothers are alienated the effect is just as devastating on their children and on themselves alienated mothers are simply not as prevalent due to custody assignment bias men's rights groups will resolve the issue of parental alienation. Fact, these groups of men are perceived by the public at large to be threatening because they polarize people against each other. Our patriarchal history makes the public wary that these groups plan to really reinstate patriarchal order. This is a human issue and a children's welfare issue. The family law system helps prevent and resolve parental alienation. In fact, lawyers and judges are supposed to be experts in the law. They are not behavioral experts at all. Their claiming to know what is best for children is unethical and dangerous. Cross-examine of affidavits, 
cross, sorry, cross-examination of affidavits, and even reading affidavits often does not even occur. Yet decisions are made without evidence based on one party's anecdotal affidavit or statements in court, sometimes both. Stalling tactics are used until the client runs out of money or the child reaches 18. Family lawyers have a lucrative industry with very little accountability. And mental health experts, recommended by lawyers, often promote the, that lawyer and client's position because that's who's paying their fees. Court orders are toothless and disregarded by alienators. Intervention counseling alone for the alienator will be helpful. Fact, alienation is a cult. Children must not be left with the abuser. Assessment and treatment for mental illness using medication and behavioral modification therapies are necessary together while children are transferred to the care of the targeted parent. If and when treatment is successful, and only then, reintegration of the alienator into the child's life should be carried out slowly and with consistent, consistent monitoring over the long term. Alienators can learn to co-parent. In fact, cooperation does not align with a campaign to destroy the other parent. Court-ordered mediation counseling and JDRs, uh, um, justice dispute resolution hearings, fail because the alienator perceives him or herself to be above the law and understands that the system fails to penalize non-compliance. So what do we do about this problem? Well, uh, Kara and I have come up with in networking with other experts as well with a plan for resolution and this is a, a, a very brief overview of that plan but it starts with default equal parenting and that absolutely has to happen that's the very first thing so one of the criticisms that I've heard is well we can't do default equal parenting because some parents work shift work okay well then work that around their schedule so that it comes out 50-50 because everyone works uh, you know, in, in a flexible work environment these days in some way or another. Uh, second, well, you know, some of those, especially fathers, could be abusive. So should they really have their children half the time? If they lived in an intact family, they would be parenting half the time. So what follows is that when you separate or divorce, one parent suddenly becomes evil or incapable so again, that argument falls down pretty fast. So after default equal parenting, there has to be an access enforcement program. There isn't one right now, but there sure is maintenance enforcement to make sure people pay child support. And we know the penalties are very real and very harsh in that maintenance enforcement program called MEP in Alberta. And so we advocate for an access enforcement program which would basically work the same way. If you do not follow the parenting order, there are real penalties, and those are, are followed up on immediately. Uh, there is triage, which will occur when high conflict or mental illness is suspected or reported by either parent or an involved family or friend. So really anyone can say, I'm not sure about this couple who's separating, you know, they've got a history of of a, a volatile relationship or you know whatever for whatever reason either parent could report which would put put both parents on an equal footing as well as soon as triage is uh, um, recommended by any involved party then there would be a case manager assigned who is a mental health expert and has expertise in the area of children's welfare issues and of course parental alienation there would be psychological assessments done on both parents. In fact, what happens now is courts will often order psychological assessments, but in reality they are carried out on the child and the alienated parent. The alienator never shows up or avoids the assessment at all costs 
because that alienator knows there are no penalties. If parental alienation is found following psych assessments from an unbiased psychologist or therapist who is interpreting them, then the child is removed from the home of that alienator, no matter what the parenting arrangement. The alienator with treatment and monitoring, if he or she can prove to be now capable of co-parenting, then that parent will become, again, a part of the act of parenting in the child's life. Monitoring in parental alienation cases has to be ongoing by default until all children of the marriage or that prior relationship reach 18 or age of majority. Now, one of the biggest criticisms I've heard about our model is that it would cost too much to monitor these kids until they're 18. So my answer to that would be, what is the social cost now of generating a whole, uh, I can't even imagine how many, how many kids in Canada alone, hundreds of thousands of children are growing into at-risk adults and with higher, a higher potential for addiction, criminal behavior, uh, self-harm, and the list goes on. That social cost so far has not been uh, added up and even, even guessed at, but I suspect it is probably far higher than any kind of prevention using this kind of a model. And so, um, to get this done, what, what do we do? You know, what can, you, can all of us do? Because I think beyond your own situations, you're probably also concerned about legislation. Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we prevent this from happening in future? What do we do to actually eliminate this problem, not just reduce it in my own personal case, you know? Um, so I really encourage you to write politicians. And so up here we've put a link to the MPs and, and MLAs that uh, are within, you know, easy, easy reach for you to just write a letter and, and copy it to all of them. Uh, also to the Attorney General and Minister of Justice for Alberta, who, who right now is Kathleen Ganley. Uh, please do that. I wanted to read to you a letter that I got the other day from a grandmother. And she has been unbelievable at following up with politicians and, and just really being a thorn in their side, but in a very positive way. And I think she's on her own is really achieving uh, a lot of attention. And this is helpful for all of the thousands of families suffering parental alienation. She's in Manitoba. And so she wrote to their uh, Attorney General, Heather Stephenson. And so just very quickly, she has said that she's very concerned that um, the advisory committee that has been set up by the province of Manitoba to look into the problems with family law that advisory committee is made up of eight lawyers and three individuals with no expertise in the area of child issues. And so she's asking, you know, why that's the case. And so then she did get a letter back, and I must say, uh, Heather, jo uh, Heather Stephenson signed it herself, the Attorney General, and so, you know, excellent. And maybe she'll be, a, a, you know, an actual progressive politician. But she has said, um, thank you for your email where you in express concerns about family law. I agree with you that our family law system requires significant reform. That's why I've established an advisory committee of legal experts and community leaders to establish a framework for an administrative model for family law in Manitoba. And it goes on talking about how this will happen. And so then that's why um, this grandma has said, yeah, but it's made up of, of lawyers and people without expertise. So the idea may be good, uh, but how it's carried out may be deeply flawed, but it's a step forward. And last, um, demand that your involved experts are competent. I think that alienated parents especially, and grandparents, extended family, um, I know that you're, you're suffering a lot and you don't know what to do. And so writing these letters and things are, are wonderful long-term ideas that hopefully will make a difference to how we conduct our family law system. But you also have the right to demand that the people who are working for you and that you are paying fees to are actually competent. 
So don't be afraid to ask those questions, you know, to uh, even have a, a preliminary interview. And if they say that they are parental alienation experts, which I hear a lot, um, then on further questioning, they really cannot show me that they actually are experts in that area or not. For example, they will often interchange the words estrangement and alienation. And as I said, estrangement is where there's a, a good reason why the child has severed ties with one parent. <coughs> And when you use those terms interchangeably, that is, without even knowing it, uh, pointing a, 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 point, a finger of blame at the alienated parent, right? If the child is estranged, it must then mean that the alienated child is actually an abused child by the alienated parent. So language matters. So we want to use the term alienation and enmeshment when we're talking about the alienator who is drawing the, the child into their, their vortex of control. Um, so please do that, ask, ask questions of your experts. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, there is a multitude of evidence, very sound, peer-reviewed studies everywhere, hundreds of them, and so there is really no reason for experts to say, oh, I hadn't heard of that, or I'm unaware, or I don't think it's real. We have passed the awareness part of this issue. We are now at acceptance and we're moving towards activism, which is how do we resolve this in society at large? Um, just a little plug for myself and I guess the people that I'm, I'm working with. We have two things coming out. So um, Kara and I have put together a book based on our study of 30 families. So 28 from our original study and then two current stories of, of two families that are involved in, in parental alienation right now as we speak and dealing with a court system that, if anything, has even gotten worse, not better, since my own personal case uh, with my family, which started over 13 years ago. Um, and so uh, we want to compile that book so that you can relate to other families and, and ones that maybe your situation is similar to and, and what those parents did to try to resolve the issue. It's not a happy book because I have taken the transcripts and I've written them exactly in, in the voice as far as I could of, of the alienated parent who told me the story on record. Um, and then I also have a couple of chapters on uh, how to resolve the issue using the model that I just briefly discussed here. And secondly, there is a documentary coming out next year called Erasing Family. And that is done by a filmmaker living in uh, San Diego. She's very well renowned. She did a previous film some of you probably have seen called Erasing Dad. This one is called Erasing Family and it focuses more on children of alienation and how they are coping as they approach adulthood. She was recently in Alberta and uh, interviewed some, some students at Mount Royal University and at University of Calgary and these are children who are now adults who volunteered and said my life has been hell since my parents split up and I'd like to tell you my story. And so that will be the focus of, of the film that's coming out uh, next year. So feel free, I encourage you to go to that website, erasingfamily.org, and she can always use uh, donations still to get the thing finished. And so um, there are many ways you can be involved. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Chris. I don't know if everybody thought of that, but we're going to have a, a panel discussion a little bit later. Um, we will be fielding questions. Um, very informative, lots of information. Um, you know, it, it was nice. I, I, I had the view, and I don't know if you guys are all familiar, but we had a psychologist in house, so I was really just watching for the head nods. So it's uh, it's really nice to have actual research that uh, people have gone and done the trouble of finding out and also helping with solutions. Um, now, <coughs> we, we, we brought two keynotes today because there, there's two sides to everything and uh, we do think it's important to look at all angles, not just one side of things and not to say that what Christine said was one side of things, but it's definitely a, a, another angle to approach things <coughs> at. And um, in, in any of these situations, it's difficult regardless to whether there's problems or not. Um, maximizing our, our mental health and well-being for our family, avoiding fractured families, uh, common issues, concerns, overcoming the stigma of mental health, 
creating and implementing um, solutions. Uh, we now have uh, another speaker to speak today, and it's uh, Dr. Robert Whitley from McGill University. Uh, please welcome him to the stage. He's come a long way. I'm very pleased to have him here. Uh, okay, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to first off uh, thank Dan and uh, the organizers of this conference for uh, the very kind invitation. Um, I have come a long way, but I, I think it's worth it because the issues I'm going to talk about today are incredibly important. I'm talking about uh, suicide, I'm talking about depression, uh, I'm talking about lack of services, uh, and I always take the opportunity to accept these invitations. Um, even if it is over a weekend, just before Christmas, uh, when I have other things to be doing. So uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for the invitation. Uh, thanks for having me, and great to see so many uh, people out today. Um, so I thought about a, ver a variety of uh, starting points for this presentation, and I thought what I would do is start off on uh, strong ground, for me at least, something that I've re researched for many years. Uh, and this is the impact of divorce on mental health and mental illness. Uh, and I'm going to present to you a series of kind of findings and conclusions uh, which have been, um, many studies converged into these set of conclusions. Uh, and the first thing is that we know that divorce and um, parental separation, uh, separation even if you weren't married but you were common law, uh, is what we call a risk factor uh, for numerous mental health out outcomes. Um, so that means that it increases your risk uh, compared to people who are not in, uh, experiencing the same event. Um, so divorce has been shown to be a risk factor for depression. Uh, it's been shown to be a risk factor for suicide. Um, it's been shown to be a risk factor for um, self-harm and for substance abuse. Um, so these are four very negative mental health outcomes. And we know that individuals who go through a divorce, uh, obviously not everybody, and uh, uh, some people um, cope better and manage better, but uh, their risk during these transitions is much more increased. Uh, so it's a time when psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, with good reason, are often worried about mental health and people might need services, etc. Um, the studies do indeed show that divorce is negative for both men and women, and we should never forget that. Um, however, an, an interesting uh, part of the studies is that men seem to be much more severely affected by divorce uh, than women. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides, as the, the whys and wherefores and the consequences of that. Um, uh, divorce also has a negative impact on uh, the children. Uh, so as the previous speaker said, um, childhood, early childhood experience often determines adult uh, outcomes. So uh, things such as uh, mental illness in adulthood, criminality in adulthood, suicide in adulthood. Uh, risk factors for that is negative experience uh, in early childhood. Uh, and some of these negative experiences in, indeed include divorce. Uh, so basically divorce is really bad for your mental health um, is the conclusion. Probably many people in this uh, room have personal experience of that, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Um, so why does divorce affect the mental health of men more? I'm going to uh, talk about some research and some hypothesis, and uh, some of this has more evidence and support than others, and some of it is more speculation. Um, but if you look in Canada, across Canada, at the various provincial jurisdictions, um, only about 15% of uh, men obtain exclusive custody of their children, whereas around 10% around have shared custody. So each jurisdiction has, uh, each province has different definitions of this uh, exclusive and shared, etc. So it's hard to compare. Uh, but what we do know is around 75% of men. Um, in a divorce, go from a time where they're seeing their children uh, seven days a week, um, 31 days a month, 365 days a year, often to seeing their children four days a month, one, every other weekend for one or two days. Um, and obviously, if your um, uh, children are a very important part of your life, uh, very attached to them, social, probably the most important social relation many humans will ever have, um, when that's kind of taken under your feet, that's a huge, massive, difficult experience. Um, so I put there that that means that there's a severe process of loss uh, and isolation and expropriation for the men concerned. Uh, they lose um, 
uh, in the process of a divorce, um, a, a man will lose his wife, a wife will leave, lose her husband, um, a man will lose his children in terms of that access, as I just said, whereas a woman will often have, a, sole, have a primary custody, so will be seeing their children. Uh, what we do say, uh, what we do see is that both, um, uh, both parents uh, will often have to spend a lot of money uh, on lawyers, uh, will lose a lot of their savings. Uh, will lose a lot of um, uh, their time, so time they could have been at work or conducting kind of leisure time activities which promotes their health and um, keeps them embedded in society instead of dealing with lawyers, etc. Um, some people have suggested well, uh, there are fewer services targeted at men during these transitions. Uh, so I did a study in Montreal recently uh, where with very low, low income men, men who were working, they, they weren't unemployed and they weren't on welfare, uh, but they were in low income jobs. Um, and they said to me, which I found it difficult to verify, but it seems plausible that um, their wives were able to access kind of legal aid clinics and free resources and free lawyers from kind of women's centres, uh, which I'm all in favour of, by the way. Um, if people are on the low income, uh, there should be some kind of supports. Uh, but the men said that they were not able to access similar services because these were women-only services and were provided at women's centres, etc. So we, we see a variation there. Um, so these men often had to spend get loans, uh, get another job, which also reduced cons um, contact with their children and uh, made, it, made it very difficult for, for the men to um, continue their relationship with their children. Um, another thing that we know from studies is that uh, when a man and woman get married, um, a woman is much more likely to continue with her pre-existing friendships uh, and also continue close relationship with her own kind of family, sisters, cousins. Uh, this is an empirical fact from a variety of studies. Uh, whereas men are actually much more likely to contract their uh, pre-existing relationships and really kind of put all their eggs in one bar basket in some ways uh, and really devote most of their social time and uh, their life to, to their wife and to their children. Uh, so that, off that also means that in a divorce, uh, men are losing kind of almost everything that's been their social foundation. Whereas for women, obviously it's very difficult as well, but the research shows uh, that women st during the marriage will keep a lot of their contact with sisters, with cousins, with their own parents, with family, uh, at a relatively higher than men. Um, and as was alluded to uh, kind of in the introduction, uh, uh, we live in a society where there are messages about me what it means to be a kind of a man uh, by the media, by Hollywood, uh, also by uh, all of us here, people in this room will often use these phrases often about thinking. Uh, some of the, these phrases, man up, be a real man, uh, this involves kind of shaming men. Um, so this means men may feel, well, I don't want to go and see a psychologist, I don't want to see a psychiatrist, or I don't want to access a service that's available for me because that means I'm not a real man and I'm not manning up. Um, so that means if men are affected by these issues and they're having psychological, psychosocial issues, uh, they're much more likely to kind of suffer in silence. Uh, and what I find is when one looks at the literature, um, there's a lot of what we call victim blaming in public health, so the men are blamed, uh, whereas in fact they've been shamed by society, so they're really just at the end of a chain in a way, uh, which pe uh, everybody's contributed to. Um, and there's a fellow called Philip uh, Zimbardo, who is a, a uh, psychologist <coughs> at Stanford University in the US, who con conducted the famous um, Stanford prison experiments in the 1960s. Uh, he wrote a recent article, which I, I found very interesting, called um, The Empathy Gap, uh, where he says that uh, people talk about the gender gap, and he calls it the empathy gap, where there's a lot less empathy for men in Western societies. Uh, I'd highly recommend you look this up, it's on the Psychology Today website. Uh, free, free, access it freely. Uh, where he says he just says empathy for men is in short supply, empathy for boys is, is in short supply. Uh, that this is partly due to social construction, social conditioning, but also due to evolutionary biology. Uh, whereas where society has just evolved, where there's much more sympathy and empathy for women who are in distress. Uh, the kind of idea when a ship is sinking, it's women and children first, uh, men last. <coughs> Uh, that this actually affects all different dimensions of society, including um, psychiatry and psychology and psychological services. Um, and I, I think this is instantiated slightly in this kind of slide that I put up, which was, uh, it's a little bit um, 
provocative, deliberately provocative. Uh, but men experience what we call a double bind. A double mind bind is a psychological phrase for kind of contradictory statements that are kind of impossible to resolve. Um, and, and what we often find, or we hear phrases like this, and I, I travel around the country, uh, other countries, talking about men's issues, and people often come up to me afterwards, or even students in my classes, and they'll say things to me like, well, if men have mental health, health issues, it's men's fault because they're being hyper-masculine, um, They've got to stop being stubborn. You constantly hear that men are stubborn. And they've got to open up and talk about their problems. So men are being berated and, and belittled uh, for not opening up, for being stubborn, for being hyper-masculine. Um, and there's a little bit of truth that some men uh, are like that, and it's an issue, and no one denies that. Um, but then simultaneously to that message, men are also receiving a, uh, another message uh, from people who sometimes protest events, kind of Warren Farrell, uh, people who talk about male suicide and other issues have given lectures which have been protested where there's been people shouting and yelling and pulling fire alarms etc uh, and these people say how dare men get together and talk about their problems and complain that, that we live in a patriarchy and they already enjoy male privilege so we hear these kind of things so men are in this double bind where they can't win and that's something which I think we need to address as a society um, so what can we do for kind of men who are experiencing mental health issues and are, who are uh, divorced and have maybe suicidal ideation, depressed? Um, well, there's the existing mental health system, which can be very helpful, but some research or some people have, been, have suggested, there was a famous paper in the British Psychological Society uh, magazine called um, Is Are Mental Health Services Inherently Feminized? Uh, where um, the, the authors and a group of other people have suggested that present mental health services are really based on a kind of feminine model of healing, a, a, a singular model of healing. Uh, this is the idea that you sit in a face-to-face -face and you talk about your problems and there's a lot of emotional vulnerability uh, and that this is really kind of a, a, fe a feminine way of communication. Uh, whereas these people have suggested that men prefer a more active form of healing, which is more, uh, some people say, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder healing rather than face-to-face -face healing where men are kind of doing things also talking about issues but the, the sole purpose of the issue is not uh, the, of the interaction is not kind of therapy and being revealing it's self-revealing uh, so I put up here a list of kind of innovative services um, Movember is investing lots of money in men's mental health so when it began it focused a lot of its work on prostate cancer uh, but more recently it's been funding mental health programs and some of these have been really effective and I've put one example, you can look up on the internet the others up there, men's sheds. Uh, so these were formed in Australia, now there's some in British Columbia and in other parts of the world. Uh, these are basically kind of youth clubs for men, uh, in, well, that's what I call them anyway, uh, where older men, men who have gone through a divorce, who are lonely, isolated, will go um, and there'll be activities there for kind of woodwork, uh, cooking, fixing bicycles, uh, maybe watching hockey or whatever. Uh, but in addition, there'll be kind of a, um, social workers there or people, psychologists, people talking, talking about issues which arise organically. So as I said, that kind of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder healing rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, and some research, preliminary evaluation shows these are actually really helpful for men experiencing negative transitions. Um, and who are uh, kind of lonely and isolated. Um, I put there men's centres, um, and I, there's in Toronto, we have kind of men's centre. Um, so I visited there last year, um, actually this year, earlier this year, January, uh, which um, haven't been evaluated, and there's uh, plans afoot here in Calgary, I think, for a kind of men's centre, which, uh, um, uh, but these are again places where different modalities of healing can be enacted. Uh, and I finally put their kind of men's self-help groups, uh, official and unofficial. Um, so um, they're self-help groups for various demographics in society, for women, women's self-help groups, immigrant self-help groups. Uh, there's some men's self-help groups, and there are some which are official, which I think are great, which are uh, um, organized by a psychology, psychology clinic or by a hospital, and men are encouraged to go and talk and do things. Um, but there's also kind of unofficial men's self-help groups and uh, I've been doing some research recently on men who practice um, pick-up pick up artists who pra practice uh, kind of seduction and uh, what they call game 
um, and they uh, get together once a week and they talk about this. Um, and in a way, that's a kind of unofficial self-help group. Uh, a lot of these men have tried to have anxiety, um, have uh, um, issues, uh, they were bullied at school, they feel awkward, they, they say they're socially awkward, etc. So they go to these kind of men's self-help groups, which are on paper about kind of seducing women and picking up women, but actually talking about things like social interaction, about um, communication, about dress, about um, having hobbies, about making yourself an interesting person. And uh, kind of my own theory is that in the absence of, um, I put I put there there's fewer services targeted at men and those in transition, uh, and um, that when you don't have official services for men which are useful, that nature abhors a vacuum, that uh, men are going to get together in their own kind of self-help groups, and we don't really know what's happening in those unofficial ones, and maybe it's not things which society would approve of. So it's important to actually fund official men's health services because the alternative might not be, uh, um, uh, people might not approve. Uh, what I wanted to do uh, briefly is show a, um, maybe just five minutes of a video um, that I helped co-produce. So last year, um, I received a grant from November, um, and this is uh, based on the model I said of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder healing rather than face-to-face uh, -face healing. Uh, and I said, what I'm going to do is get together a group of vulnerable, isolated men with mental health issues. And instead of taking the typical psychiatric approach and uh, just talking about, ask them to talk about their issues face to face in a clinic, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, somewhat intimidating, we'll get together as a group, we'll do a fun project. And that fun project is actually making a video about what it is to be divorced, to go through a divorce here in Canada. Um, and not only will this give an outcome that can be used educationally, which I'm going to do today, uh, but also will be a kind of form of therapy and a form of uh, uh, empowerment for these men. And actually, the evaluation of the project shows it was very empowering. Uh, it helped promote their recovery, um, and it also gave us this great kind of final product that we can use um, educationally. So um, I'm going to show the video. I've got kind of one more slide after this, a kind of last slide. Um, can someone tell me how much time I've? I forgot to put on my timer. How much time have I used? One minute. You put your thumb. I said we're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, should I show five minutes, ten minutes? You bet. Five minutes. Five minutes. Je suis séparé depuis bientôt euh, trois ans. Euh, encore aujourd'hui, même après trois ans, euh, c'est pas, euh, pas réglé encore. Euh, je m'appelle René. Je me suis séparé en 2005, après 23 ans de mariage. Je dirais que ça a été un, un choc. Ma fille est née en juillet 2009, puis euh, j'ai vécu un conflit avec la mère, puis euh, nous étions plus ensemble. J'ai vécu ça très, très difficilement. J'ai fait une dépression profonde qui a duré euh, au moins euh, un an, un an et demi, quasiment deux ans. Au début, ça s'est relativement bien passé. On a été en médiation, euh, mais tout a dérapé dans la médiation, puis on s'est retrouvé euh, cinq ans à la cour. Quand le père peut avoir des, des beaux échanges avec ses enfants, ça fait vivre des choses euh, positives ou des choses euh, essentielles, je pense, à, à toute situation familiale.
C'est jamais un contexte qui est facile pour n'importe quel membre de la famille, que ce soit l'enfant, la mère ou le père, mais il semble que les pères soient tout particulièrement vulnérables dans un contexte de séparation conjugale. Euh, ce qui arrive, c'est suite à la séparation, plus fréquemment, ce sont les mères qui vont annoncer de façon officielle euh, la séparation. Euh, les pères sont plus en état de choc euh, et à ce moment-là, voient moins euh, c'est quoi les étapes ultérieures qui s'en viennent, donc les modalités de garde. Souvent, ils vont quitter, ils se retrouvent à avoir moins de contact avec leur enfant, donc moins de contact avec leur conjoint de par la séparation, moins de contact avec les enfants. Euh, le réseau social aussi est appauvri. Les hommes, comparativement aux femmes, vont moins verbaliser ou aller chercher le soutien de leur réseau. Ils vont davantage miser sur eux en se disant qu'ils sont capables de passer à travers cette, euh, cette épreuve-là. Ils vont essayer de trouver les solutions. Alors effectivement, lorsqu'on les rencontre, c'est par là ce qu'ils nous disent, c'est ils sont seuls, ils sont isolés. Ils ont ce sentiment-là de solitude, d'impuissance, d'incompréhension, de détresse. Euh, qu'on observe là, régulièrement. Pour moi, la, la séparation était un véritable échec. Quelque chose que j'avais énormément de difficultés à accepter. Tellement honteux que ça m'a pris du temps avant d'en parler. J'ai gardé pour moi ce que je vivais. J'ai essayé pendant un bon bout de temps de, je dirais, de, en bon français, de gommer euh, mes émotions euh, par le travail, euh, par le conditionnement physique que je m'entraînais. J'allais au Nautilus des fois Certaines semaines, sept jours sur sept, il y avait une chanson qui roulait à l'époque d'un compositeur qui s'appelle Jonathan Pinchot. C'était « Je poussais, poussais de la fonte pour oublier la honte ». C'était vraiment ça. Je, je me défonçais pendant deux heures de temps pour essayer de noyer toutes ces émotions-là. J'avais l'impression, comme beaucoup de gars, je le réalise aujourd'hui avec le recul, à, à vouloir me dire « bon mais je vais m'en sortir par moi-même ». La solitude, non, mon Dieu, la solitude a été très présente pendant la séparation, en particulier au tout début. Aujourd'hui, avec du recul, je réalise qu'on on on peut être bien entouré et vivre et éprouver énormément de solitude. C'est très difficile, hein, parce que moi, je vivais ça comme un échec personnel. Puis, tu sais, des fois, on juge trop euh, sévèrement. Fait que c'est ça qui est le plus difficile, c'est d'accepter les choses, de pouvoir les dire aux autres sans euh, se sentir jugé ou sans prendre ça comme un échec personnel. C'est ça, peut-être, notre, notre, notre pire ennemi, là. C'est notre euh, difficulté à, à communiquer nos problèmes. C'est ce que je remarque euh, beaucoup là, des hommes. Là. Ah, parle-moi plus de ça, je veux pas revivre ça. Fait que si on peut le partager, ben ça permet de, de digérer, euh, on va dire, cette solitude-là. Fait que on se sent moins seul, puis en même temps, on a un meilleur regard sur la situation puis sur nous-mêmes. Moi, dans mon cas, l'isolement, ça a duré. Euh environ un an. On ne les connaît pas, les services. Il euh, n'y a pas beaucoup de campagnes d'informations de, à ce niveau-là. Même en faisant des recherches sur Internet, euh, c'est pas évident de trouver euh, le bon service. J'ai consulté au tout début euh, une psychologue, euh, une travailleuse sociale au CLSC. Donc ça, ça m'a ça beaucoup aidé. Et puis, euh, par la suite, euh, je suis allé euh, à Père séparé. Euh, j'ai parlé beaucoup, j'ai rencontré des gens et puis euh, à un moment donné, je voulais retourner au travail seulement quand toutes mes choses étaient pour être réglées. Euh, en parlant avec d'autres pères séparés, je me suis rendu compte que ça pourrait être long. Donc, euh, ça faisait pas tout à fait un an que j'étais en arrêt de travail j'ai décidé de retourner au travail. 
Et puis, euh, c'est ça qui m'a beaucoup aidé aussi. Euh, on va voir dans un certain nombre de situations des hommes chez qui le réflexe d'isolement euh, va être lié au modèle traditionnel ou à la vision qu'ils ont de ce qu'un homme devrait être, solide, euh, autonome, capable de faire face, ou euh, au rôle de père tel qu'il le voit, qui doit être là pour les autres, qui doit être là comme protecteur, et qui donc, pour ces raisons, des raisons de valeur et des raisons de rôle, euh, vont se condamner eux-mêmes à mettre en arrière ou mettre en, en, euh, de côté leurs propres besoins, euh, avec le risque, malheureusement, parfois même de l'oublier carrément, euh, ce besoin. J'avais l'impression d'idéaliser l'importance de l'indépendance et être autonome. Donc, j'avais associé euh, ma vie, la, la réalisation de ma vie et la réussite par tout ce que moi j'allais construire, seul et euh, avec personne. Alors pour moi, ma vie, euh, mon passé était un peu le garant du, de, de l'avenir. Euh, malheureusement, euh, cette maladie et cette séparation m'ont rapidement ramené à la réalité. Alors tout ce que j'avais construit autour du mot autonomie, indépendance, réussite, en réalité, euh, c'est s'effondré. Je me suis retrouvé vulnérable et, et complètement faible. Ce qui est important de savoir aussi, c'est que j'ai eu des pensées suicidaires et j'ai été prêt à passer à l'acte, j'avais acheté une corde. Faut que tu ailles au fond du baril pour savoir exactement jusqu'où tu dois aller chercher de l'aide. Mais je me souviens de toujours un fameux adage, il disait que le suicide c'est un, un acte permanent par rapport à un problème temporaire. Et c'est à l'époque une amie qui, qui m'a référé père séparé en disant « Patrick, tu ne peux pas continuer comme ça, il faut que tu te fasses aider. » Juste le fait que je n'étais pas tout seul et qu'on vivait tous la même souffrance, s'est euh, révélé quelque chose en moi. Donc j'ai décidé de devenir intervenant, pris une, une offre qui s'est offerte à moi. Et j'ai continué donc à travailler au père séparé dans, dans les groupes de soutien et dans les têtes à tête. Um, I think I'll pause it there. So it's a 20 minute long uh, video and it's available on YouTube if anyone's interested. Um, so that's the first half, which uh, really kind of outlines the problem faced by men going through this transition. Very common. I've shown this to audiences across Canada and other places actually, and people say, yeah, we recognize this. Um, I'd encourage you to watch for the purposes of time, won't watch the whole thing, but watch it at home. Uh, because the final 10 minutes are actually much more positive and optimistic. Um, so the men go on to talk about how they've, uh, um, their resilience has improved over time, the things they've done to cope with the situation and how they're trying to give back to other men. Um, so it's actually a, uh, it becomes a very positive video and I think very helpful for anyone who's going through uh, this situation. Uh, just to give a bit more context about this group, um, they're men who are uh, Uh, in the east end of Montreal, one of the poor neighborhoods. Uh, like I said, work, working men, um, men often who made you know a bit more, um, who just made not not wealthy by any means, um, but made the, didn't make a um, made more money than the legal aid limit. So often had to get into their savings, but not certainly weren't very wealthy. So went through some really hard times in a really great group of like brave men. Um, and really what I wanted to do now was kind of end on a, just a kind of a, um, as a professor of psychiatry to give some uh, things about what can be done to promote your own mental health if anyone's going through this situation presently. Uh, and obviously clinical services are very helpful, seeing a psychologist, a psychiatrist um, uh, can be very helpful. Uh, but there's also things that you can do in your own life. Uh, which research shows can help kind of stabilize someone who's having mental health issues and can help foster their own recovery from a mental health issue. Uh, and I just kind of listed them there and are probably self-evident to most people in this room. Um, first is kind of exercise. So a lot of research shows that exercise can be actually um, almost equally as helpful as an antidepressant for people who are depressed, if you can get people exercising on a daily basis regularly. Um, second is kind of hobbies. 
Um, so uh, exercise is a hobby, but other hobbies, team sports, uh, fishing. Uh, some guy who I recently went through in a study that I did, went through a divorce, told me he was learning to fly, was getting a private pilot's license, and that this was really helping him, you know, occupy the time that he used to spend with his wife and children and meeting new people. Uh, routine and structure. So a lot of the people in my studies tell me that um, that they've been used to doing everything with their wife, their children, or women, their husband and their children, um, and therefore their kind of routine and structure gets completely uh, uh, out of kilter with uh, what they were used to. Uh, and a lot of this dead time can be very difficult to handle on a Saturday or a Sunday. Or, um, so to do hobbies, um, to get out of bed, to go to bed at the same time, uh, to really try and um, get that together. Uh, I'm not trying to convert anyone here, but this is a uh, uh, fight, fight empirical finding from the research that religion and spirituality can be very helpful during uh, a divorce or after a divorce. Um, whatever religion or spiritual tradition you ad um, adhere to, and a lot of study for Aboriginal people, for example, um, say that that can be helpful for people who have gone through a, a breakup, uh, but also for non-Aboriginal people and going to a church or synagogue, getting involved in a community, prayer, uh, reading scripture, that stu study I did a few years ago, people said that was really helpful to help people cope. Um, and I put there a kind of bit of a st slightly technical term, what they call the fresh start experiences. Uh, so this basically means some kind of fresh start in life. Um, it might be m moving into a new neighborhood, a kind of challenge, uh, like the guy I said he was learning to fly, um, maybe start a new relationship with, a, with another person. Um, uh, a new job, that these uh, or a new part-time job, or volunteering somewhere. Um, so all of these kind of overlap to really try and um, uh, try and help people. Um, and really, that's all I wanted to say. And feel free to uh, contact me if uh, anyone wants have any questions. Thanks. thought there but uh, I, I was really into that movie I would have let it kept going but yeah I understand <laughs> uh, I, I, I really enjoy the fact that, that it's subtitled for me I don't speak French so kind of really gets my attention a lot more uh, I really get focused on what they're saying and, and you can feel that and uh, I think it translates really well um, <clears throat> and this time I just want to invite Tom back up to the stage here uh, Tom are you around here we are. All right. As promised, I was going to be back. I can't see because I'm Got all this modern technology up here. Mm -hmm. It's got to be going. So I noticed that uh, Christina, in her uh, comments, made uh, something about MEP. And uh, some of us have experienced MEP, and uh, maybe not on good terms. I have to share with everybody that I just got notified that I'm getting my airplane license back. Now I think that's pretty fantastic. Now what's more fantastic is I've never had a license. <laughs> Anyhow, so like I mentioned earlier, I was going to explain briefly what and how Canadian Association for Equality Calgary fits into all of this. Well first of all, we are our a national non-for-profit organization with a focus on equality for everyone. In our Calgary branch, the main focus is on maximizing a family's mental health and well-being. Now that said, our involvement in this vision has many different layers to it, from educational and awareness seminars like what we have here today, to supporting the Canadian Centre for Men and Families. Now many of you will say, ask the question, why the Canadian Centre for Men and Families? Well, in our wonderful review, underneath the umbrella of equality, we noticed that there was a shortage. Well, in actual fact, there is no full-time facility today in Calgary to help men and families. So in order to have healthy families, we need healthy moms and we need healthy dads. So in brief, that's basically what we do. 
Now, on a totally different topic, I would like to thank some very key people and supporters of our efforts. First of all, if I can get all our volunteers to stand and take some recognition for their time and efforts, that would be great. Well, that's probably half the audience here. <laughs> all right. Because really, without you guys, events like this wouldn't happen. I would also like to uh, thank our supporters. So first of all, I'd like to thank Robert Olson from the Center of Suicide Prevention. And as you probably noticed out in the front foyer, he had some great information and, and tips and stuff like that. He's been a, a great supporter of CAFE. I would like to uh, thank Melanie, Jane, and Linda from Positive Choices Counseling, specializing in family social work, child welfare, and parenting experts. I can personally say I really appreciate the help that they've provided myself and my family in moving forward, and I look forward to their long-term commitment with us. Dr. Whoop, let me get my technology going here. Dr. Hanita R. Dragon, Dagan, registered psychologist with Kaylor Clark Psych Psychological Services. Um, and I think this is rather interesting, at least for me. So their key area of practice, or one of them, is civil forensic services. That should be like a TV show. <laughs> so basically they assist parties, parents, lawyers, and ultimately the court with decision, decision making for families and separation and divorce. And I think that's pretty key. I would also like to thank uh, the constant support from the Affinity Psychology Group. They are a family psychology practice offering support to individuals, couples, and families across the lifespan. More importantly, the way I look at it, they are also the su supporters for the part-time location for the Canadian Center for Men and Families here in Calgary. So please, give these folks a big round of applause. <laughs> we also have Dorothy Briggs, uh, publisher of, magaz of Divorce Magazine, and is also a great supporter of CAFE. In fact, um, there's gonna be an article on uh, CAFE, and I think, Dorothy, I'm right, is it January, February? First week in February. I mean, how great is that, right? A magazine writing an article about CAFE. Thank you very much. And uh, Dorothy also has some magazines out front there. I uh, hadn't had a chance to browse through it or whatever. Um, now again, I guess, uh, where else do we have everybody here? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna get, yeah, I'm missing a page here. Yeah, 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 getting there, there we go. <laughs> a little technical disadvantage, short fingers don't move the pages as quickly. <laughs> Anyhow, we do have uh, thanks to Dr. Gantz um, for being here today and being a supporter of CAFE as well. Dr. Gantz holds a PhD in counseling psychology and an MA in development and educational psychology from Andrews University in Michigan. Dr. Gantz enjoys sharing how people can get more mileage from their lives. Plus, as an author of The Me Factor, which is a new book coming out, should be, I believe, on stands in January? January yeah, February, somewhere. Like All right. So look forward to that, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be some good things in that. We'd also like to thank uh, Instant Imprints for their support in providing us with some uh, giveaways that we have here today, and also in helping to get the word out uh, about what CAFE is all about. So thank you. Basically, you know, CAFE can't say thank you enough for everybody that supports us in our drive in our direction to, to help others. So thank you for everybody that supports us and backs us up in this. There's one very important uh, item that I need to address and ask of. As you walked into the auditorium, you all were handed an envelope and this wonderful little piece of paper, right? And a pen. Now the pen's very important, believe it or not. It's great, it's got our logo on it and all that kind of good stuff. But I would ask that you take a minute of your time and just review some of the options that are available there for making a donation. Well, this is our first time really asking uh, our supporters and that for help in donations. We are a non-for-profit, so without support, we really can't put on seminars like this and we can't help the Canadian uh, Centre for Men and Families grow their uh, ambitions too. So for every, every dollar counts. Um, and today, we uh, are very proud to say that for the month of December, we have a very special supporter that will match your donations up to $5,000 in total. I think that's a pretty incredible uh, gesture and very well appreciated. I mean, where else can you go 
make a donation and have your money <coughs> twice as far. I mean, that's pretty incredible. So this truly will help uh, in our adventures uh, moving forward, not only with CAFE, but also for the Canadian Center for Men and Families and that. I ask that if you uh, make a donation or commitment today that you drop off the card on the way out. Um, there's gonna be some little boxes out there that you can just stuff it in there. Um, or if you wish, you can take the envelope and you can put cash in it, or you can save it for another day and just mail it back to us, that'd be awesome. Um, in exchange for your help and support, uh, we have coffee mugs there just so you don't forget about us. Um, and all donations over uh, $20 will receive a tax receipt. And I'm getting a little nod back here by the guys that's going like, come on, wrap it up, wrap it up, you're taking too long, you gotta get it going here. So, uh, one last uh, sort of thing that's on my agenda is um, on June 9th, I think it's June 9th, or is it 8th, 9th, 2018, we will be holding the CAFE National Conference here in Calgary. That's a pretty big step. Uh, we're a small organization that this got started, so for us to hold a national conference, that's a big to do, and it's all because of, uh, I guess, the need and aspirations of everybody that's here. So thank you for that opportunity. And uh, thanks again for everybody for coming out, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll keep on going. And I guess it's back to Don. Thank you, Tom. Um, at this point, um, what we have uh, in store here is, uh, Tom mentioned uh, some of the additional experts that we have here today. So I, I'm gonna invite them up onto the stage. Um, uh, Hanita, Robert, and Gans, if you guys can come up. Now, um, I'm also gonna invite Christine and Robert up as well. Um, we do wanna have um, Chris and Rob lead the on-stage discussion uh, amongst themselves with the experts, but we do want to be able to field some questions from the audience as well. I'm sure uh, a lot of people have some, some questions right now and uh, are probably uh, itching to ask, and uh, that's why we brought this uh, panel here today. Good, feel happy and be healthy so that we can pass that on to our kids. And our next guest is uh, Robert Olson. He's from uh, the Suicide Prevention Center. And I'll let Robert here introduce himself. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so I'm Robert Olson from the Center for Suicide Prevention here in Calgary. So we're a branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. We're located uh, downtown on 12th and 10th. Um, so we, we provide, uh, our organization provides gatekeeper suicide prevention training throughout the province, most notably ASSIST, uh, some of you might be familiar with. But in addition to that, uh, we have, we house a suicide research library, which I'm a part of, and we endeavor to collect all the academic research on suicide that's published. And to date, we have some 45,000 articles directly related um, to primary research, uh, the stuff that Dr. Whitley or Dr. Giancarlo uh, uh, do, but uh, just those um, articles pertaining to suicide and suicide prevention. Uh, what we use a lot of that um, uh, huge uh, repository of information for is to um, make it more useful for larger amounts of people by translating it into more accessible language, and that's what I do a lot of. So you could call it secondary research, tertiary, or knowledge translation, but that's uh, quite a big uh, part of what I do, so. Yeah, and you guys are also um, partnered with the Crisis Line too, right? Um, well, indirectly, yes, but yeah. uh, informally, but we work with them quite, quite um, regularly, yes. Awesome, thank yeah. you. I'm Hanita Degan. Uh, I'm a registered psychologist. I'm also a registered parenting coordinator and arbitrator, and a registered marriage and family therapist. I'm part of a group, uh, as was alluded to previously, uh, where we specialize in civil forensic work, and uh, people aren't quite sure what that means. It has nothing to do with CSI. It's about working together with the legal system, the courts, with respect to families that are unable to find the less intrusive remedies for their 
issues that arise from separation and divorce. We offer a continuum of services that I like to call from the uh, more preventative, less intrusive, such as counseling for individuals, children and families, uh, moving across the continuum to uh, mediation, where parents together can make decisions for the best interest of their children, arbitration when they are unable to make those decisions and they require an expert to do so, and we move into the court-ordered services and um, just for people to understand when we are court-ordered to provide an intervention for families, we are friends of the court. We're not friends of either lawyer. We are friends of the court and our role is to be objective and neutral. And the services that we can provide in, in those circumstances are, uh, again, from intrusive, or I'll say less intrusive, to more, um, including parenting coordination, uh, practice notes, which is something unique to Alberta that doesn't exist anywhere else, where we provide short-term interventions for families to help them uh, focus on the best interest of their children, all the way to the most intrusive, which is called a bilateral or a practice mode parenting time and parenting responsibility assessment, uh, which requires all parents and all children to be assessed. We like to be on the other end of it as much as possible, but sometimes the more intrusive interventions are required. And, and I think you bring up a lot of great points, and I don't know if everybody understands, but you know, if, if we had proper programs and proper mental health and everybody got along, we probably wouldn't need to go that far. And uh, I think it's important for people to understand that these are very extreme cases where, you know, we're in the Court of Queen's bench instead of having a proper discussion. Well, Chris, if you want to start out between yourself and Robert, um, I, I'm sure you guys have lots to, to talk about it amongst yourselves. Uh, it's been a really interesting day hearing everybody speak today. I know that I found myself really listening to everyone. And, uh, I, I, I actually got a question for Chris and Robert. Um, just based on your research, do you find that it is better for um, parents to, like in terms of the effect on the kids and on the parents, is it better to leave and uh, seek divorce or is it better to stay in a conflictual relationship for both the kids and the individuals? <laughs> I, I think each, each situation is definitely different. And perhaps ultimately, I personally, I would think from the child's point of view, what message is the child learning from the parents? Because it's the parent's job to teach their child to be an independent and, and uh, good person and to be able to survive in a very complex world. And so if your message to your child is that you should stay in an abusive relationship because look, I'm doing it, is that the message you really want your child to carry forward? On the other hand, uh, if you are a parent who is always uh, um, discontented and is wanting to move on because, for instance, you found a new partner, and so you have decided to leave the marriage because you found somebody better, with more money, better looking, whatever, uh, what message is that passing on to your child as well? So that means commitment doesn't mean anything and that you just move on when you get bored. Uh, so I think that we really have to look from the perspective of the child in order to make those kinds of, of calls. Um, yeah, from, from my knowledge of the literature, it, it's not a good idea to say stay together for the sake of the children in many cases. And um, as was just said, case by case basis, but as a general blanket rule, that's, that's not a good idea for a child to grow up to see 
parents fighting or yelling at each other and uh, with lack of love and uh, the contrary, a lot of uh, uh, discord. Um, so I, I would uh, kind of agree with what was said. That's Yeah, because what I've noticed in my practice as well is, is that same thing. And what we try to teach parents is that, you know, it really is about being healthy and happy. And the, and the kids need to see healthy, happy parents. So if that is accomplished by being apart, that is what needs to happen. If, it's, if you can do that together, obviously that's more ideal. But uh, it really boils down to what, you know, what's in the best interest of the kids. What can the parents handle? And I think it's important, especially for the audience, for those of you who are, have been divorced or separated, to know that that's, we all do the best we can with what we got. And so it's, if, if you've done something, if you've made a certain choice, understand that you, you were acting in your best interest with the information that you had at the time, and that's the best any of us can do. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to fight over it. Yeah, yeah. Just a, I'm, I'm really just reiterating something I said earlier that uh, the parent's job is not to be the friend of the child. So if you're friends with your children, great, but that would be a secondary consequence of you also being a good parent first. And so I think that is a question that all of all of us parents can ask ourselves: is you know, are we being parents first and setting those appropriate boundaries? And, and teaching our children how to survive on their own, or are we making them overly dependent? You may have heard the term helicopter parenting, and we're seeing that a lot these days, so parents that are too involved in their children's lives, so that uh, warning sign of enmeshment is very clear in the case of helicopter parenting, and the child is not learning to set its own boundaries <coughs> and solving its own problems. No, this is not supposed to go. <laughs> so I just want to make one point that I think is very important given the, the question that was raised. It's important to understand that it is not divorce mm -hmm. that has a negative impact on children. There are many children whose parents divorce who do very well. And I would bet there are some of them around. Uh, it's the conflict between the parents that causes the problem. And so, with respect to making a decision, uh, as uh, was just mentioned here, I think it's really important for the parent or the parents who are trying to reach a very, very difficult uh, a decision for their children, as well as for themselves. Uh, to ask whether they are able to separate and have a cooperative relationship or whether being in the marriage is possible to have a, co a cooperative relationship. And it is different for everyone. For some people, when they separate, it makes things better and it reduces conflict. For some people, it increases the conflict. So. That's what has the negative impact on children. And I think people need to realize it's not always a bad thing to divorce. Okay, it's finally your turn, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I just had a question for Dr. Whitley. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you've had any follow-up with this group, because it's been about a year and a bit now, right? From the YouTube presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, we've developed uh, very friendly relations, so I see them um, about once every couple of months. Actually, they, they had their annual general meeting in about November last year, and they asked me to be the keynote speaker, uh, which was pretty cool, so I got to meet a lot of the other. They serve uh, hundreds of men across Quebec. Um, in Montreal, they have like a face-to-face -face service where people can come and they can, uh, there's like a, a lawyer who offers pro bono services, and that those two Two of those guys are like um, uh, intervenor, um, like uh, caseworkers, um, who actually had careers before that, but got so into the issues that abandoned their previous careers and became caseworkers. And they, um, uh, I, I see them regularly. The um, they're having a 
conference in March, a two-day conference where they've invited lots of uh, great speakers, but sadly I'll be at, 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 out of the country for another conference, so I, they asked me to be a speaker, but I wasn't able to be there. Um, yeah, they, they're, doing, they're all doing very well from what I can see. Uh, they're going from strength to strength. Um, they also just recently started doing a lot of Skype uh, for people in rural Quebec, uh, doing interviews um, who can't make it to Montreal, men who have gone through a bad divorce or recent separation. And um, oh yeah, but some uh, very good news that we got, not really related, it's a bit related to your question, well they tipped me off about it, that the Quebec government's recently announced $31 million in uh, funding for men's health research. So not even, men, not mental health, but all, all health. And uh, that's partly due to organizations like this and others activate, being active and advocating. So uh, yeah, we hope to make a video in like a part two one day, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's been, a, this, we were pleased a couple of months ago, the Spanish media picked it up and uh, did an article and embedded the video in um, we got, I got all sorts of emails from Spain afterwards, which was pretty cool. Excellent. Yeah. So it's uh, also for those who like uh, feel like doing something. I mean, it was we, we did get a grant from November to do it, but it was not not a massive grant to make a video like that, which can be used educationally. Is uh, it's, it's kind of a lot of work, but it's, it's perfectly feasible for a, you know someone like this, this group in Calgary to make a similar video. Um, we got together like once every two weeks on a evening and we got pizza as you can see and uh, we taught um, somebody taught uh, a videographer I mean that was the main expense taught them how to kind of use a video so what I didn't say was they did all the scripting and they did all the filming and all the sound I was very much in the background so uh, if anyone here is looking for a project uh, if you remember my last slide was saying that hobbies and uh, activity is very good for your mental health think about it thanks Uh, I, I am really interested in this Movember idea, and I'm glad to see that it's picking up some, uh, some, some awareness, some publicity. But we have campaigns such as Walk a Mile in Her Shoes for domestic violence against women. Um, I'd like to see one that is focused on everyone, because domestic violence, of course, is also largely a men's issue as well as a women's issue. And so um, I, I think the, the gendered aspect is problematic and, and we still need to work hard on that. And in terms of Movember, I asked my students, and I have right now over 200 students, and I asked them how many of them knew about Movember, and most of them put up their hands, and then I said, what is it for? And most of them said, I think it's a cancer thing. So they clearly are not getting the message at this point. So I don't know if anyone can add to that or anything that's being done to, to maybe increase the public awareness on that. Well, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say, well, they're, they're not wrong. I mean, it's prostate cancer, right, mm -hmm. primarily. So it is, it is, um, Getting involved as, um, as uh, Dr. Whitley said, uh, into more mental health issues, um, but uh, maybe uh, people's awareness of that is it's cutting in. yeah um, is uh, not where it should be. I don't know. Do you want to add to that, Dr. Whitley? Um, just how old are your students? Eighteen to twenty-one. Yeah, I think we can cut them a bit of slack. <laughs> They know who Kim Kardashian is, and <laughs> they've got their cell phones and social media. Um, I mean, Movember is like trying to raise awareness about prostate cancer and mental health issues, which are, prostate cancer obviously affects older men much more, and also they're trying to target people with money who can donate. So, um, but I, I see that as our role as professors at universities to kind of make, make them aware. If they got to the age of 30 and uh, didn't know what Movember was, then be worried. <laughs> I see a lot of head nodding today, so I think it's really good that this panel is kind of in agreement on a lot of these things, and I think it's great for everyone to see. So the, uh, the concept of father deprivation and the effect on kids um, later in life was brought up, and I wanted to know kind of what each of us sort of ex has either seen or knows from the research about that, and if we can talk a little bit more about that, that would be perfect. 
I think Chris, you brought that up in your presentation, right? So. I think there's a common misconception that because conflict was also brought up. The idea that in order to avoid conflict, that one parent should just leave. And I mentioned this also in my talk, and we now know that, in fact, it's uh, the conflict is not a good reason to lose a parent. And the long-term effect on a child of losing a parent for that reason is greater than the conflict. So in other words, the, the conflict does less damage than father absenteeism or mother absenteeism. And so even where there's conflict, we need to make sure both parents stay in the child's life. And so the conflict very much is being created and exacerbated by a court system that does not know how to handle the problem of following divorce with custody arrangements and to enforce parenting orders. And that's what really needs to be tightened up. As well, we're not going to get cooperation by both parents where parental alienation is involved because one parent does not want to cooperate. And so again, in order to reduce the conflict, uh, one parent will likely be the one who may leave the alienated parent because that alienated parent feels that they, they are causing too much conflict in the child's life and they actually are blaming themselves for ramping up the conflict when in fact the alienator is causing massive damage to that child and the alienated parent needs to, and I would say, has a duty to stay in that child's life at all cost. And so that's why, as a last resort, parents go to the legal system asking for help and the help is simply not there at this point. That's a, a, a complicated issue. Uh, however, uh, I would like to say that um, I believe very strongly, and, and it sounds like most of the people, if not all of them here as well, and that is supported by all the research. The children require a meaningful relationship with both parents. That means their mother and their father or their mother and their mother, or their father and their father, but they require a meaningful, positive relationship with both parents. And we know from the research that mothers bring different qualities to their parenting as do fathers. And I guess that's why there are mothers and fathers. So children can benefit from the different qualities and characteristics that they each contribute. We know that fathers tend to be, and this may sound stereotypical, but it's hard research, fathers tend to be more adventurous with their children, take more risks, and I don't mean that in a negative way, encourage them to do things that are a little more exciting. They like to rough and tumble with them more than mothers do. Mothers talk more and perhaps uh, are the ones that might be uh, doing the more quiet activities. And I could go on and on. But those are all qualities that are important. Children need to be adventurous and curious about the world and want to explore. And fathers are interested in doing that with them. Uh, mothers bring uh, another aspect. So we need both parents. But what children really need is both parents in their life, they need a home base, and they need peace in their lives. Well, I can't speak to that um, particular term you, you were using um, in relation to suicide, but there, there is a lot of research on, um, on adverse childhood experiences and it features suicidality. So, um, um, to cut to the chase, a stable home, um, um, including two parents, uh, generally will will um, predict probably a, a less chance of suicidality down the road. So, um, yeah, for me, um, I, I come back to well, there's an African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. And I think the more support, I mean, traditionally we had more people around us, you know, uh, in human history, 
uh, extended family groups, um, the, the church or the community to help raise our kids. And with mobility and the increase in technology, we're having less and less actual face-to-face -face support around us now. So I do think that the more that we can have both parents and uh, you know also grandparents, extended family, everybody else involved in raising the kids, uh, really does give them a better chance of success in life and less chance of some of the hardships. And I think that's a great tie-in to what we're here for today, too. Um, just a tad a bit of kind of sociological context to that question. Um, there's been waves of uh, fatherless fa families throughout history, especially in the 20th century, after the First World War and the Second World War, there were um, hundreds of thousands of children who were brought up without fathers because their fathers died in the uh, war. Um, but during those times, we were in a completely different demographic situation. So people had more brothers, more sisters. Um, so what would happen is that if, uh, on average, say your father died in the Second World War, that your father had three or four brothers, three or four sisters, his parents were still alive, and you'd be kind of adopted by that side of the family. So, but what's happening now in this parental alienation phenomena is that uh, children are being basically cut off from 50% of their family, and uh, as somebody said, uh, you know, 50% of themselves in some ways. So uh, this is a completely different kind of social phenomenon. Um, and you know, in terms of mental health, uh, we know from the research that it predicts short-term and long-term adverse uh, mental health in the short term. It's a risk factor for ADHD and for conduct disorder uh, and the long term risk factor for substance abuse, suicide, criminality, um, being in a fatherless family. So, yeah, very sad. And we also know that when one parent is deceased, especially at the end of the world wars, um, that parent is perceived as almost a hero. Uh, in the family, and so the child still retains uh, an excellent self uh, perspective that they are valued and valuable because they have two worthy parents, even though one is has now been lost to them. Um, in the case of, of many divorce cases and parental alienation, uh, they are removed from a parent who, so the child is grieving for that parent, but they also see themselves as bad because they're grieving for that parent because that parent has, they have been told that, that that parent is evil and therefore they are half evil. And so now they even feel shamed and ashamed that they are grieving this horrible person. And so they are, they are being raised with double the, um, you know, the, the burden, I think, on their shoulders and how they will be able to manage that is, is very questionable in future with that kind of self-loathing, even from the childhood stage. If it's okay, I'd like to sort of move this to a bit of a different angle. Can, uh, can I say something about that, just yes, on that point? Yes, yes. point? Yeah, so I'll just share a little bit of my personal situation with, with you guys as well. So um, I'm actually a child of lots of conflict at home and also parents who probably were quite, um, probably had personality disorders, probably narcissistic personality disorders. And, and so they did exactly that with the parental alienation, but I got it from both sides and it was a very big struggle to figure out where I fit and the, the, the sense of my identity and the sense of being valuable. And so it is, it is really important that pe parents know that supporting the other parent, even if you don't get along with them, mm -hmm. supporting their values, supporting the fact that they maybe did their best or they want to help or fostering that connection is extremely important for the child's mental health and their well-being. And just another plug for, you know, guys don't go to therapy. Um, I've been in therapy for 27 years and I love it. So it's like, you know, I'm not just a provider, I'm a customer too. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, I guess you're married. Your marriage may have ended, but your marriage to your children is forever. That's very true. So that was a good segue. What I wanted to say is to talk about the fact that it doesn't have to be so negative, and children don't have to bear the brunt. And so I'd like to just mention 
although it was stated here that divorce is a risk factor. It's not the, the factor, it can be a risk factor. There are protective factors. And that's really important for parents to understand that there is a lot they can do to protect their children from negative impact of divorce. You mentioned a very critical one, and that is first and foremost, both parents need to value the importance their children, how important it is for their children to have a relationship with both parents. Not just in theory, not just when they're signing a document, but by how they demonstrate it to their children, by their words and by their behavior, supporting and encouraging the children to spend time with that parent or enjoy the time with their parent, not just to say, you did what? Not to quiz them about what was going on with the other parent as an interrogation or a means of uh, obtaining evidence. It's important that uh, they provide warmth, nurturing, and flexibility, whatever the parenting arrangement might be. Those are very critical for the children to know that if something comes up in their life, uh, they need a change, they need something out of the ordinary to happen, it could be a change in their routine, a change in their needs, that they have the confidence that they can go to their parents and they'll be responsive to that change rather than having parents who will argue about it. <coughs> parents need, above and above all, good communication in order for any of the things that I've just mentioned to actually occur. They need to be able to speak to each other, resolve issues, and speak in a, a, a civil, polite, and respectful manner, particularly in front of their children. Another thing that is a protective factor is having good boundaries. Respecting that if there are two homes, those are both their children's home, and they're equal, and equally important. That they have a boundary in terms of not speaking poorly about the other parent. They have a boundary in terms of understanding that when their child is with the other parent. They won't interfere with that time. They won't um, somehow by mistake, apparently, plan activities or important event events at that time. But they will respect it because they hope that it will be reciprocated when it's their time. Another factor to raise, and this may bring a whole other conversation, is that it's quite common and expected that parents may repartner at some point in time. And that can often bring about many other complications, but with respect to boundaries and with respect to uh, respect, the parent with the new partner needs to understand that they should not be bringing that person into their child's life quickly, and uh, the research tells us it could be between one and two years before they are officially a couple. On the other hand, the, the, the perhaps, well, not necessarily non-parent, but I'll say the other parent, whoever that might be, needs to accept that there is someone new in their child's life, with all that that entails. So I, I don't want to give a, a long lecture here, but I think those primarily are protective factors. And if parents can keep the conflict away from their children and show respect to each other, and as you said, that is respect to your child. Children should not be nomads running around without knowing where they belong. And they need to know that they're cared for and loved and that they can care for and love their parents. Just to add to that too, uh, you know, what, what I really, when I work with my couples, I really want to stress that when, the best solution is to have um, similar or consistent rules between the homes, if they can, if they can work that out. 
if they can't work that out, then it's really, really important that both parents support the rules of the other house. Just speaking to the boundaries uh, comment there. So, you know, if this is the rule at, at dad's house, then you need to follow that rule. It might be a different rule at our house, but at that house, that's what you need to do. And you can't, you can't uh, be undermining the other parent because it really hurts the child when you do that. Um, there was another point, but I forgot it. Now. <laughs> I think too that, we have to, we're, we're talking about perhaps two different contexts. One is where both parents are healthy. And if both parents are healthy, they, they, are, they can co-parent or they can learn to co-parent. If one of them is mentally ill uh, because of borderline or, or narcissism, it's simply not going to happen. And so all the counseling in the world will do absolutely no good because one parent's goal is to make sure the co-parenting doesn't happen. Yeah. And I think it's the recognition of the difference between parental alienation and just a dysfunctional partnership or ex-partnership that needs to be separated first thing. And so that's why we advocate for a high conflict if reported or even a potential high conflict situation for it to first be determined whether in fact we're looking at uh, uh, two healthy parents or not because the, the therapy that needs to, to occur will be quite a different protocol, I would expect. Uh, certainly, uh, parents with uh, significant mental health issues are, are absolutely more problematic, and I don't know that therapeutic intervention is always the first step, but there are many other remedies to assist parents who are having difficulties. We tend to see parents after separation and divorce as falling into three categories. If I could, I can't draw it, but I can visualize it. The very conflicted parents, I would say at the bottom, what we call parallel parenting in the middle, and then the cooperative parenting on top. And 20% um, are in the conflicted range. So let's not forget that many parents are not in that low area. And some of them who are, it has to do with the fact that the separation is very fresh. And that we often will see that parents begin with difficulty and as time goes on and with appropriate assistance, uh, I say you can climb the steps. Not everyone can get up top, but parallel parenting <coughs> is an appropriate remedy for parents that are having ongoing difficulty. And um, there, as I said, there is assistance available. One of the remedies that's available to help parents who do have difficulty is something called parenting coordination. I don't know if we want to talk about that at this point. Well, and, and what we can talk about now also is building any questions from anybody who may have some for anybody on the panel. Uh, and, and if you do have questions, please come up to the front here and we can pass the mic down.